Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Semaphore Uncut, a podcast for developers about building great products. In this new episode, Darko, the podcast host, welcomes developer advocate and seasoned IT industry veteran, Nicholas Frankel. Nicholas shares effective strategies for API evolution, delving into the complexities of API design and uncovering the pivotal role of API gateways in modern architectures. I hope you enjoy this new episode, and let's dive in. Today with us, we have uh, Nicola Frankel. Hi, Darko. Thanks for having me. I've been working in IT for now more than two decades. For 17 years, I worked in uh, consulting in different roles, developer, team lead, architect, solutions architect. And a couple of years ago, I became dissatisfied with that and I became a developer advocate. We have recently launched a CICD learning tool with shortcuts into everything you need to know to level up your CICD process and increase your productivity. Also, to ensure that all our customers get the best CICD guidance, we have improved our sign-up process. From now on, everyone who's considering using Semaphore will get personalized CICD expert guidance from day one. Our engineers have more than 10 years of experience, so you'll surely be in good hands. Check it out on our website, semaphoreci.com. Can you give us a bit more detail what you're what you're working on and what's the company working on and so on? Sure. So right now I'm working on the product called Apache API 6. As the name implies, it's an Apache project. It's an API gateway. It's based on Nginx. Very good, very solid reverse proxy. Unfortunate bit about Nginx is that it was designed at a time where switching it off and on again to change the configuration was not an issue. But nowadays, if you have an entry point into your information system, then you want hot reload of configuration. So for that reason, there is a layer called OpenRST, and it allows to change the configuration of Nginx dynamically through Lua scripts. However, it also needs some improvement because it's very unstructured. So on top of that, there is Apache API 6, and it provides some concepts such as routes, for example, and plugins and upstreams, and everything is plugin-based. And as I mentioned, it's managed by the Apache Foundation, of which I'm pretty sure like everybody is aware of. And well, it's... Super interesting. After more than 20 years, I'm working on an Apache product. Great. That sounds sounds super interesting. And um, I mean, APIs are an interesting um, thing because um, evolution through the product lifecycle and all of that uh, is um, requires like a special type of mindset and approach. With the UIs, it's a little bit easier to change some things and so on. With the APIs, you don't want to break things up because, you know, machines on the other side can be, you know, are always quite strict and just adding a data field or removing it and so on can be cumbersome. But also as product evolve, maybe the structure of different resources within the app is also going to change and evolve. So I know by ourselves and by consuming other APIs that developers kind of want from time to time to say, okay, now we have a V2 or V3 or V4 and so on. Can you talk a bit about that on the, from kind of a very high level, how you see that and what are your experiences? So it's hard to talk a bit about it. I think you can write a book about it. I have condensed it to a talk that addressed some of the aspects, but I can like condense it further perhaps. So first, something that you said, you can remove fields and add fields, it will break stuff. Well, um, even if you don't consider HTTP APIs, but just like regular APIs that we have been using since ages, then if you add something, that's not really an issue most of the time. The problem is when you change the type of something that you expect, or when you remove a field, or when you change the name of a field. That's really a big issue. So we need, in this case, to like break the contract that we have with our like customers. There are a couple of ways to, I wouldn't say like remove the issue, but at least to, let's say, like erase the problems a bit. The first is we just continue like using the same interface toward the outside world. For example, an API gateway can help you when the provider, you change the contract of return something, then you just like change it back to the original before returning to the client. 
it doesn't change the world. Of course, then you API from the Kalian perspective is the same. From a performance point of view, it's probably very bad, but at least you didn't break anything. Otherwise, you can start to break things and provide two different versions. And then comes the fun part. In general, when you start creating new APIs, you think about your model, you think about the boundaries between the entities, uh, probably you think a lot about all the rest concepts that are very blurry, that contradict each other, that don't map exactly to how we work, but you still read a lot about it. And then you know the different about the past and the put, and you think, oh, I can use patch there and everything is fine, but you mostly don't think about versioning. And so when actually you need to break things and you need to version, it's a mess. So for all people who are listening, I would suggest that becomes a primary concern. And it's actually not that hard if you think about it from the beginning, because there are like three version, versioning approaches. Path-based, like you have slash v1, Dictionary is the most used because it's easy, because everybody can see it. Query-based, not that much used, but still a possibility. And header-based. So depending on the approach, header-based can be just as simple as version column number, or it can be on the accept content header, like you have VND for vendor, V1, whatever. It's a bit harder on the client side because well, you need to provide additional stuff. However, on the provider side, it's much easier because, for example, when you have an API getaway and you need to uh, like forward some API call v1 or v2 on the upstream, then you first need to remove the prefix v1 or v2 before forwarding it. So it's additional configuration, whereas you can forward it as it is directly from a header perspective. So there are both pros and cons. Just think about it, but both are completely acceptable. But yeah, you are sure that at some point you will need to introduce a breaking change, just like in regular software. You touched upon, you know, that, you know, beautiful models that you thought of and all the rest, uh, all the resources and actions on them and so on. But as product evolve, you will end up having models that you never thought about and the relationship between models are going to end up... Um, being potentially even messy, you know, and complicated and so on. And try to be kind of a perfectionist in that, you know, resource and rest approach to things. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think there is perfect rest or pure rest or whatever. Of course, there are some solid foundations, like A, use the HTTP verbs. But I have always like this stupid example of a bank transfer, right? You actually are not manipulating one single entity, but two entities at the same time. So what verb should it be? The verbs map mostly to CRUD, but as soon as you want to evolve beyond CRUD, which in general, like proponents of object-oriented programming or all that stuff, it doesn't map correctly. And you need to be smarter or you need to be creative or you need to. I recently read a, a book API Design Pattern by JJ Gwalks. It's a guy from Google who wrote it. And basically, he takes from his experience in production. Some things, in my opinion, are a bit controversial or I would have done like different ways. But just the fact that it doesn't map completely, A, you create like a specific additional verb, not like an HTTP method, but you append something to the URL. It's a good approach as any, but at least it solves the problem. And the more important stuff is consistency. If you always approach the same problem with the same solution, you add consistency. And as a developer, as a client, that's what, what you expect from an API. You probably don't expect like a pure REST stuff, again, because it doesn't exist. There is no such thing, but you expect consistency. So the first time it might come as a surprise, but then the second time it's handled the same way and it becomes like a habit. Even if you don't come up with the perfect solution, at least it works, people become accustomed to it. And if it's all throughout your API or your APIs, then it's perfectly fine. For the people that haven't worked with uh, API gateways, 
can you give us like a initial high level introduction of why sure so for me and that's my personal definition like um, api gateways are reverse proxy on steroids i hope i assume that everybody has now a reverse proxy protecting their apis or apps from outside access and now comes the interesting part in reverse proxy for example the like classical example is they protect you from like distributed uh, denial of service attack, DDoS, because they implement some kind of rate limiting. That's fine and dandy, but now come APIs. And now as an API provider, there is a chance that you cannot rate limit every client the same way because some of them might be like free clients, some of them might be paid customers. And parts of the payment is for a higher limit. So of course, if you don't know API gateways, what you would do is you would like start configuring the reverse proxy for that. Now comes the fun part. Reverse proxy are very technical pieces of infrastructure. So when you start mixing business logic in them, comes the fun part. First thing is business logic changes a lot. And frequently, because business is very creative, they will always find new way to like break your stuff. As I mentioned, Nginx, very solid, very mature, but not very feasible to change the configuration often. So what happens is you need to switch it off and on again, and again, API is not possible. And the second thing is, okay, then you need to probably to like do something else. And in that case, come API gateways. And my ID, my definition of API gateways is like a reverse proxy that can be easily configured with business logic. Because as I mentioned, you can have like different kind of plugins, at least in Apache API 6. Those are written in the Lua language. So you can write a generic plugin and then configure it differently. Then you apply the configuration, it's changed dynamically and everything is fine and dandy. And you can isolate the business logic port in this plugin. And of course, you can have different business logic in different plugins, so they are all isolated one for each other. And I believe that's the use case from for uh, API gateways. It's like a reverse proxy. It's like an entry point into your information system, but with the added benefit that it's able or even it's designed to handle business logic that changes frequently. We have recently launched a CICD learning tool which shortcuts into everything you need to know to level up your CICD process and increase your productivity. Also, to ensure that all our customers get the best CICD guidance, we have improved our sign-up process. From now on, everyone who's considering using Semaphore will get personalized CICD expert guidance from day one. Our engineers have more than 10 years of experience, so you'll surely be in good hands. Check it out on our website, semaphoreci.com. And at what point should uh, should a team consider implementing API Gateway and ju just, you know, disconnect their app from being, you know, straight on, on the internet without anything in between? So again, as I mentioned before, the app shouldn't be exposed on the internet, period, never. So reverse proxy just for security is just like basic stuff. Now, once you start having like a single entry point, it's very easy to move stuff outside from your app to this single entry point. It can be authentication, it can be rate limiting, it can be a lot. I come from a Java background and we have lots and lots of libraries who can provide like such capabilities. But if you need every one of your apps to implement the same, and every one of your apps needs to be configured in a different way or in a different place, then it doesn't make any sense. So as soon as you start having two apps or two APIs, then you really should be thinking about moving to an API gateway and move those like infrastructure concerns outside from your app to the API gateway. 
what is a more standard stack is you know http plus potentially you know a json a combination within within apis i would if someone i would be explaining to someone i would say hey this is a default way to do it you know and most people are, are used to it but over time as you know is on the industry there are those you know there are hypes and peaks of different things. And um, there was a time I feel that we are kind of past that period a bit of, you know, Graph, GraphQL, for instance. And this is something that I wouldn't maybe describe as a as a hype, but, you know, uh, just a, a different way of doing things. You know, gRPC, I, we use it internally for the communication between our services and it, it worked quite well for us. So I would just like to hear your thoughts on, you know, th- those different ways to solve the same thing, essentially. First thing first, um, I have no direct experience with GraphQL. Um, so I only attend talks and stuff, so I cannot comment on that. However, from my like very restricted point of view, we are getting back to SOAP. Like there now we, we have a single point of entry and we post. And it makes it harder on the API getaway because now it's not only about the HTTP method that we can apply to, we need to inspect the payload, which can be a security issue sometimes. But that's general comments. I, I won't comment further. Second, XML fell out of favor, but still XML is much better than JSON. XML is much better than YAML and so on and so forth. So my personal preference would be that XML will still be there because we have a grammar. We can validate stuff. Again, we can like externalize some common concern that like the data needs to be in this format without having to do it in our app. But the ship has sailed like web developers. They say, oh, look, it's like JSON is so much better because we don't need to learn like hard stuff like XML. And I agree that XML makes simple things harder but have a thing simpler. Anyway, it is how it is. Now regarding JSON and gRPC, it, there are pros and cons like everywhere. If you are very concerned about performance, then of course, gRPC seems a very good thing to do. However, when you start using gRPC, it means that the consumer needs to have the model. So if you like do breaking changes, then it's much harder on the clients. So unless you are using an API gateway that allows you to translate gRPC calls to standard JSON calls, and by the way, just mentioning it, Apache API 6 does it, I have written a blog post about it, then you should probably like keep gRPC inside your information system where you control everything, but that's where it's the least valuable because inside your information system, you probably don't have that much issue about performance. If you are a fast moving company, then probably it's better to have like regular JSON. If you are more established, if it, you have like really strengths, like changing, like deploying to production four times a year, then gRPC is not that bad. Yeah, that's clear. One inter- very interesting thing that you mentioned about uh, XML, that there is there is a grammar and there is like easier to agree as there are like, you know, rules in place uh, than for instance with JSON. And I mean, over time, it has been, I mean, at least that's my personal perception, a struggle with agreeing what's a format to document the API. What is the, the generally tool for just to generate the documentation, but also to specify the payload and the format and all of that. So I have two questions here. What's the latest and greatest <laughs> in your opinion? And how do you see generally that? How should we approach that part? No, that that's in my opinion, the, the industry has chosen its open API. That's that, that's not even a question nowadays. If you write an API, you should provide an open API schema. And um, regarding what's the approach, I am like really a big proponent of contract first because that's the the beauty of API is that you can like have a stack on the provider side and another stack or multiple stack on the client side. And if you start from the code first, there is a high chance that it will feel super awkward from another stack. Like meet in the middle, start with the contract. It will also help you thinking about your API, thinking about your verbs, thinking about the rest, blah, blah, blah. And, and then like generate it with the tools available. And basically nowadays they are like 
I think for every like standard stack, there is something to generate code from an open API spec or an uh, like async API spec, depending on how you rock. And maybe for the start to for the for the end to to wrap it up a bit, someone entering the the realm of like API design. What are some of the pointers that you would like to list? Maybe in order of importance. <laughs> if you start, but you have developer experience, again, I mentioned the API design patterns. That was really, really a great book, and it's a good start. What you shouldn't focus on, however, is the rest stuff. You shouldn't try to do rest by the book, because there is no rest by the book, because everybody, every expert, have their own ID behind rest. Something very important, I believe, is to think about developer experience. Like when you design an API, and again, it can be HTTP API or like a library that you offer in your stack, you should always, always try to write the code that will call the API to have a general feeling how easy or how hard this is. Like an API should be as easy to use as possible. And if you only write the providing port, then you will have no clue. If you write an HTTP API, there is a high chance you won't be able to help the person who is writing the clients. So the developer experience, the ease of use is very, very important. Because you might have a social product, but if you have a great product and the API is more than so-so, then nobody will use the product anymore. You are generally speaking at a lot of conferences on, on various topics and all of that. So for, for our listeners who want to, you know, learn more uh, from you, from your talks and so on, what are some best places to follow you and read more from you? The entry point is my blog, blog.frankel.ch, or even frankel.ch is the entry point. And then there are links for Twitter, for Mastodon, because Twitter is dead. Now there is X, but even X is dead. For I even created a Blue Sky account just for fun. And I keep a list of all my talks on this dedicated YouTube channel, again, accessible from the homepage of my blog, because I don't remember. I think it's like YouTube slash C slash Nicolas with an S, but it's not pronounced, but it's written Frankel. And then you can access the list of my talks. I will be coming to Serbia, to Belgrade, uh, for HIPCON. I don't remember the dates, but hipcon.rso.com. Very good conference, very nice organizers. Please come, please meet me. Yeah, bigger. <laughs> great, great. Nicola, thank you so much for talking about APIs and all of that. Thanks a lot for your invite. Appreciate that. What a great conversation. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to Semaphore Uncut on your podcast player of choice so that you don't miss our new episodes. And stay tuned.